Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, Governor and Madam First Lady, members of the 66th Legislature, elected officials, members of the judiciary, guests, and citizens of the great state of Wyoming, greetings. It is, as always, an honor to speak with you today on behalf of the dedicated men and women of Wyoming's judicial branch of government. I wish we could all have been together in the beautifully restored house chamber as we were last year, but as with so many other things, the pandemic has made that impossible. As you can see, I am speaking to you from the Supreme Court courtroom instead. I am delighted to be able to report to you that the Wyoming judiciary is strong and healthy, despite the greatest challenges our branch of government or any branch of our government has endured in recent memory. Our greatest asset is our people who are just the best and they have risen to and met the challenges. I'd like to begin with a brief discussion of the unique nature of our branch and our constitutional duty to continue court operations. Under both the Wyoming and the United States constitutions, the judicial branch has the obligation to hear and decide cases that come before it in a timely manner. And I mean all cases when I say that. This is true whether those cases involve criminal charges, domestic violence protection, claims for damages, or any one of the many other types of cases in which jurisdiction is vested in our courts under the Wyoming Constitution and the Wyoming statutes. The courts do not choose and cannot choose what cases are brought before them. They are simply mandated to move each and every case filed to a conclusion in a prompt manner that provides due process to the litigants. The phrase, the rule of law, is one that resonates with all of us. Our courts apply, protect, preserve, and defend the rule of law, not in some eloquent phrase, but in each and every case that comes before our courts every day, no matter how seemingly great or small that controversy may be. There is no such thing as an unimportant excuse me, there is no such thing as an unimportant case to the litigants involved. In each of the five years preceding the pandemic, there have been at least 150,000 filings in our circuit and district courts combined. Behind each filing is a person or persons, many if not most of whom are your constituents. And that number is pretty startling when you think that we live in a state of slightly less than 570,000 people. The pandemic did not suddenly eliminate crime or domestic violence or stalking or divorce or commercial disputes that must be resolved in the courts. Crime is relentless and enduring, as is the ability of some people to inflict cruelty on others, sometimes even their own children. Stress increases crime and domestic violence, and the pandemic has generated plenty of economic and other stress. In tough economic times, a commercial dispute that might have been worked out may end up in the courts as the participants are simply cornered economically. But no matter how great the threat of illness or death the pandemic presented, court personnel had to carry on and move those cases to resolution. And they did, each and every one of them. Early on, we at the Supreme Court consulted with the Wyoming Department of Health in early March of last year. And I would, I would want to uh, thank the department at this time for the time it has spent advising us over the past year. With that advice and working with the circuit and district judges, we all figured out as best we could what needed to be done to protect, to protect judges, employees, lawyers, and litigants. We had nowhere near the information we have today at that point in time. We didn't know if masks were useful. We thought the virus could be readily spread by touching surfaces an infected person might have touched. And we lived in a world um, where our medical specialist didn't even seem to know or have the means to treat someone infected with the coronavirus. We all heard of and saw fatalities and enduring and debilitating injuries inflicted on citizens in other countries than our own country and ultimately in our own state. So we all did what we could with what we had and what we knew. 
The Supreme Court, in consultation and agreement with the district and circuit courts, began issuing a series of recommendations for operations of the trial courts based on what we then knew. The initial effort we all agreed upon was to stay in business while minimizing courthouse traffic to control transmission of the virus. We were also, also mindful of the measures required by the executive branch led by Governor Gordon, and we complied with them. Fortunately, we were far ahead of neighboring states in already having technology which immediately allowed remote hearings in most cases. We already had Microsoft uh, Teams, which is similar to Zoom, available at all levels of the branch, and we had equipment to allow in-courtroom and remote use, including surface hubs, which are simply computers with very large monitors. Participants who did not have an internet connection could call in from a cellular phone or a landline so they could be heard and the business of the courts could continue. This started immediately in mid-March as the virus spread into our state. A good many judicial branch employees could also work productively from home because we already had a robust virtual private network to connect them to our court network. They were sent home to work and they rotated in and out of the trial courts to minimize the risk of spreading an infection that neither we nor anyone else understood at that time. Since then, we have, had, we have been able to upgrade our technological capabilities to a level other states would envy with CARES Act funds. Thanks to the efforts of the judges who serve on our courtroom technology committee, the superhuman efforts of our tiny but dedicated technology and fiscal staffs, and excellent work by the contractor who worked on these projects. Time marched on, and as we learned more about the virus, and we began to receive reliable information about how the disease was spread and also how it could be contained, additional recommendations were issued in conjunction with the district and circuit courts. These recommendations led to a careful opening up to in-person hearings in various cases. If the judge thought that would, was advisable, consulted with local health department officials, and had a plan to keep participants safe. This effort included personal protective equipment, masking, and social distancing for participants. As a result of these efforts over the years since we began to feel the impact of the virus, the district and circuit courts have been able to keep up with their non-jury caseloads, so there is no backlog in those kinds of cases. And of course, a lot of work could also be done in jury cases. There are pretrial hearings of various kinds that can be done remotely, and the judges did what they could, preparing the way for pretrial resolution or settlement, or the eventual jury trial, if that was necessary. But, of course, Jury trials are another matter. I'd like to take just a moment to remind you about the service jurors provide in our system. We draft them as we used to draft young men into military service. We expect our jurors from the age of majority up to, to age 72 to report when they are summoned as jurors and to act as judges of the facts in jury trials. Many potential jurors are elderly. Uh, take Laramie County as an example. We have many retirees whose health is not perfect in this county. Our trial courts could not expect those citizens to expose themselves to the risk of a deadly or at the very least debilitating disease unless we could assure them that they could serve safely. It is not a choice, I will remind you, of whether to serve as a juror or not. In times when there was no pandemic, Jurors who failed to report for service without an adequate excuse were summoned to court and might be fined or even incarcerated. Those alternatives were and are unthinkable when you're talking about endangering the health of citizens who have done absolutely nothing wrong to assure jury trial for individuals who are often accused of unspeakable crimes. Our trial courts could not expect these citizens to expose themselves to the coronavirus our branch had to assure them that they could serve safely without risking their health. Over time, the Supreme Court, in conjunction with and by agreement, as always, with the district and circuit judges, developed recommendations for the conduct of jury trials. 
All court systems in this nation were struggling with the very same issues and a great deal was learned from their successes and perhaps more from their failures. Each of our trial courts had unique challenges. No two courthouses are the same and often space for social distancing is scarce. Infection rates varied from county to county. But over time, the trial courts have been able to schedule and to resume holding criminal and civil jury trials at both the district and circuit court levels. I want to make it clear that this was through the extraordinary efforts of the district and circuit judges and their excellent staffs and the clerks of district court. I would also point out that by no means do all cases set for trial actually go to trial. The vast majority of them do not because a firm trial date often leads to a plea agreement or a civil settlement. Our system is structured around that reality. If every case went to trial, we like every other court system in the country would be overwhelmed. We can expect what may in some districts appear to be a backlog of cases at this time, therefore, to steadily reduce as some cases are tried and others are resolved by agreement. I would like to take just a moment to compliment the attorneys and citizens who have participated in jury trials during this time. Complaints from either have been rare, although there is some risk to anyone who might participate in a jury trial during the pandemic. I would also like to recognize the court personnel who daily expose themselves to some risk of infection, including the clerks of district court, who, although they may not technically be judicial branch employees, are vital to the conduct of district court business. So to get to summarize this part of my address and nail this point home, <clears throat> non-jury cases are not backlogged in the trial courts and our excellent trial judges are cutting away at the limited backlog of jury trials, which will go away over time by trial or settlement. Wyoming courts are open, have been open, and always will be open to the citizens of the state of Wyoming. I will just briefly comment on operations of the Supreme Court. As an appellate court, we do not conduct trials. We instead review the record of trials conducted in the district courts and occasionally the circuit courts. What we're looking for is whether there is reversible error in their proceedings. Practically, this has meant that we have been able to continue our work with little disruption since we do not have witnesses or jurors or others to accommodate. Be, uh, during March and April of 2020, we decided cases on the briefs without oral argument from the attorneys. But beginning in May, we began to hold video arguments. We prefer in-person arguments, but we were able to have a meaningful dialogue about cases with counsel by video, and we continue to do so today. Some attorneys have indicated they actually prefer video arguments because they don't have to travel to Cheyenne um, to represent their clients here. We will see how the COVID experience impacts our future in that regard. In any event, we are up to date on our appellate decisions and we have no reason to believe that we will not continue to receive a substantial number of appeals and decide them in a timely manner. I would put our time to disposition of appeals up against that of any appellate court anywhere. The Supreme Court is also charged with supporting the trial courts and we have certainly done that in these troubled times. Court administration and two justices meet weekly with the presidents of the district and circuit judge conferences to keep ahead of coronavirus issues. We have been able to help the trial courts out with personal protective equipment and various research uh, resources on how the courts of other states are managing during the pandemic. At one point, our staff obtained hand sanitizer that came in gallon jugs bearing the logo of a vodka distillery, which they then transferred to applicators. And they did this in our library, which was closed to the public. I only know about this from watching Breaking Bad on television, but with our people masked and gowned up and filling bottles, I thought it all looked a, a bit like the meth labs on that show. But they got the sanitizer bottled, they got PPE collected, and then they delivered it to courts around the state. 
Our building has remained closed to the public. I think we all look forward to the day when we can reopen and offer tours to adults and students again. Unfortunately, we were compelled to close the Judicial Learn Learning Center that was funded in part by this body and in part by private donations until the pandemic is under control. The halls of our building, even when it is open, are usually as quiet as a mausoleum, and I think we all long to hear the young voices of students shattering the silence with their excited chatter as they visit the Learning Center. May that day come soon. Our branch has also been responsible for assuring access to justice for the least financially fortunate among us. The pandemic has hit the poor harder than anyone. The Access to Justice Commission, Equal Justice Wyoming, Legal Aid of Wyoming, and other Wyoming legal service providers collaborated to complete a statewide civil legal needs assessment. We have long known that needs of Wyoming's economically disadvantaged citizens far exceed available legal resources. Uh, and so the collaborators involved in this project contracted with DataCorp, a Wyoming company, to collect qualitative and quantitative data to help policy makers and legal service providers more fully understand Wyoming's low income population, its civil legal needs, and how those needs are distributed across the state. The needs assessment confirmed that the area of greatest need centers around family law, meaning divorce, child custody, and paternity. However, new food insecurity and employment data revealed an emerging impact of the COVID pandemic on the prevalence of landlord-tenant, estate management, domestic violence, and other issues. The assessment, which was made public in August of 2020, can be found on the Supreme Court Access to Justice Commission's webpage. The Supreme Court continues to move forward with development of the Chancery Court, a specialized business complex litigation court established by legislation in the 2019 session. The court, under the able leadership of Justice Kate Fox and with the hard work of judges and attorneys who serve on her Chancery Court Committee, is poised to complete the work necessary to bring the Chancery Court online within the time frames required by statute. However, in light of the financial issues facing the state, there is legislation pending before you this session that would allow certain sitting district judges skilled in the resolution of commercial disputes to act as chancery court judges until our state gets on its feet financially again. Other district judges would help those judges out with other parts of their caseload. If what I hear from the blockchain experts is true, there should be a significant increase in the overall workload the district judges have agreed to take on and we thank them for stepping up. We expect to have a case management system and electronic filing system in place for Chancery Court by the end of this year. The district judges could use their own courtrooms until one or more permanent Chancery Court judges can be selected and permanent facilities constructed. In any event, one way or another, the Chancery Court will be open for business with electronic filing by December of 2021. Our branch has also, <clears throat> through the concerted efforts of a very small application staff, upgraded the case management system in our circuit courts. These are the courts that handle the largest volume of cases, ranging from traffic tickets to high misdemeanors. And high misdemeanor is, of course, a crime that you can go to jail for up to a year for. There was nothing wrong with the old circuit court system called full court, but it was no longer maintained by the manufacturer and had to be upgraded to a new web-based system. Our small staff developed a process for migrating data and standing up the new system, which is called full court enterprise. Training and other activities amounted to about 100 man hours for each of the 24 circuit courts, not to mention about 500 hours to develop a manual for training the circuit courts, you, you, training the circuit court clerks. The manual developed for use by the circuit court clerks has been requested by other states who are planning to use full court enterprise, including Montana, uh, since that, that manual outlines a highly efficient model 
for standing up that system. The same small staff has now begun the process of replacing Yuser, the district court case management system with full court enterprise, and it will begin to pilot that system in selected courts in July of this year and gradually move into all the other district courts after that. Thanks to an appropriation in the last session, we have the funds required to implement a state-of-the-art electronic filing system in the district courts after we begin standing up full court enterprise. We have entered into a contract with File and Serve Express for that purpose. <clears throat> we formed a committee composed principally of attorneys with experience in electronic filing in our Supreme Court, in the Federal District Court, and in the courts of other states, and they selected File and Serve Express after uh, closely reviewing a number of systems. Other states using that program gave it rave reviews. The program will offer a variety of services, including collection and transmission of filing fees to the district court clerks, all done online. I know, and I've mentioned this before, we would all like to see the district court e-filing system in place sooner than it is projected to be. In 2019, at the suggestion of a member of your leadership, we commissioned a study to be done by a reputable firm that has consulted with courts around our country and around the world. This firm came highly recommended, particularly by the court administrator in Maryland, where it has done work for that state. The company, Justice Management Institute, concluded that our branch was on the right track to get to digital courts, including electronic filing. It also noted, however, that based on efforts in other states, our small IT and application staff is short at least eight employees to complete the necessary work in the time frame we planned. My money is on our small staff to meet the goals it is set. It is extremely dedicated and hardworking and at this point skilled uh, with the systems it works with. However, and I'll sh I'm sure you'll agree with me on that, on this next point, I see absolutely no chance of funding for additional employees to help these folks out in the foreseeable future and therefore the timetable will at best be what is currently projected. At the same time, the Supreme Court electronic filing system, the first of its kind in the nation, has reached the end of its life, although it still works. The system called C-Track is now used in 19 court systems around the country, but ours is just out of date. In the last session, you appropriated $1,741,000 to replace the system, which cannot be upgraded. We have not spent those funds yet because, as I will shortly explain, we do not know for sure if that appropriation will survive these difficult times. In the meantime, we continue to hold our breath and hope for the best, and so far, so good. I want to keep this speech as short as I can, although, it is longer than I usually like to speak because of the environment I'm giving it in. But in any event, I won't go into all the detail I might. I would instead simply refer the curious to our judicial branch website. There you will find updates on e-filing, the Chancery Court, all pandemic orders we have entered, the operating plans of each and every circuit and district court, the studies I have referred to, and a wealth of other information. And of course, our staff is available to speak with you and help you find what you might be interested in if you have problems. Now is the time to speak of the other great issue of this time, which I guess is probably both a partial result of the pandemic and partially an independent product of the nature of our state's economy. And that is, of course, the revenue downturn that affects all three branches of our Wyoming government. As I begin to talk about how our branch of government has tightened its belt, I would again like to just touch on the nature of the judicial branch and its operations. <coughs> Excuse me. As I've already said, the judicial branch has no control over the number or type of cases that come before it. Those decisions are made to a great extent by this body, which decides what conduct will violate the law and become crimes. They are also made by the county and district attorneys who prosecute crimes and who also pursue juvenile cases. 
including actions to prevent abuse and neglect to children who cannot protect themselves. These filing decisions are also made by entities or individuals ranging from the unwed mother who must seek child support for her children, or the spouse who can no longer remain in a marital relationship, or on the other hand, a multinational corporation which has a commercial dispute with another similar entity on a mineral development contract with literally millions of dollars at stake. Once those cases hit our system, judges have no option but to resolve them in accordance with the law and the Constitution. <coughs> Excuse me. They cannot say, I'm sorry, Mr. Prosecutor, but there have just been too many murder cases in this county this year. You'll have to let this accused person go for now and try again later. Justice must be done in a timely manner, for truly, justice delayed for all practical purposes is in fact justice denied. I also want to point out that the entire Wyoming judicial branch budget comprises less than 3% of the overall state budget. Our branch budget is composed 92% of personnel costs. Our employees allow our courts to continue to function and to fulfill our constitutional and statutory duties. I would also point out that our branch may be unique in that it has a system to determine whether we have the right number of judges and circuit court clerks to handle their caseloads. No more and no less. Periodically, we retain an independent contractor statistician who does work for courts around the country, and that person conducts a weighted workload study to weigh the cases the circuit and district courts have. This is not cheap. It costs about $250,000 per court level. <coughs> <clears throat> but once the study is complete, we are then able to apply those weights to the actual cases in our, in our system using our own personnel, and we know those numbers. And then we can determine if we have too few, too many, or just enough personnel, including judges. And as the workload changes, as by adoption of new statutes that add to the work to be done by the courts, we eventually have to pay for a new study again, uh, which we then use for a few years until things change once more. Before the pandemic, we were already short about four district judges according to the workload study, and that was before they agreed to take on chancery court duties. There has been discussion in the executive branch of cutting 10% of its budget. A cut of that magnitude in the judicial branch would eliminate the entire budgets of eight courts. We do not have eight courts to spare given what is shown by our workload studies. A 20% across the board cut, which has also been mentioned, would wipe out the budgets of 16 courts completely. My simple math shows that 10% of 3% is 3 tenths of 1%. That would be more than enough to cripple a Wyoming judicial branch that is highly functional, but it could not contribute meaningfully to resolution of the state's budget woes. I will suggest that it will only add to them by sending a message to companies thinking about relocating to our state that a functional court system is not a priority here and by creating a backlog of cases that would have to be resolved later at greater expense. But we all recognize where we are and all levels of the judiciary have taken steps to cut what they can. At the Supreme Court, we early on took the following steps. We eliminated or combined two positions in the Chancery Court. We were able to eliminate and combine two positions at the Supreme Court as well. Although it was embarrassing uh, to have to do so, we gave notice to the National Center for State Courts that we can no longer pay our dues, which are about $200,000 per biennium. And that's fairly important because the National Center is a great source of information to us in analyzing our own operations and giving us ideas of how to proceed, especially during the pandemic. We have reduced operational costs and contracts and expenditures for print materials and subscriptions for legal services, for legal research. Contracts have been terminated if they could be. We have reduced court automation contracts, such as one for judge tools, 
that would have helped uh, our trial judges make their hearings more efficient. We have also cut our planned hardware replacement program for the time being. I want to make clear that these reductions did not cut fat. Our operations will eventually suffer as a result of these. Like a reduction in the rations of soldiers, these cuts may not cause an immediate failure of justice, but they would ultimately weaken our system in ways that would be unfortunate for our citizens and our ability to deliver justice to them. The circuit courts have little to cut from their budgets, but they have done what they can. Two full-time magistrate positions have been eliminated. The circuit judges have also stopped using part-time magistrates. The magistrates covered certain court activities when the circuit judges were unavailable. And remember, these are what we call the 24-7 judges. The circuit judges must respond to uh, things literally uh, around the clock. Because of the excellent, excellent technology we have, however, the judges will now cover for each other remotely. This means that when a two in the morning request for a search warrant uh, in a driving under the influence case comes in, a circuit judge in Sweetwater County may be responding to a Campbell County case. The budgets of the district courts are separate from that of the Supreme Court and the district judges have also cut what they can from those budgets. But more significantly, as I've already said, and if this body approves, they have selected three judges skilled in commercial dispute resolution to serve as chancery court judges until things improve economically and one or more permanent chancery court judges can be selected. I repeat that this is not an insignificant sacrifice. If predictions by prominent legislators as to the use of the chancery court are correct, there will be considerable work for these three judges and the rest of the district judges who will have to help them with their routine caseload. Moreover, their efforts will make it possible to open up the Chancery Court by the end of the year, which I am told will tend to spur economic development through, among other things, resolution of blockchain controversies. <coughs> Added together, these changes come to a branch-wide reduction of 3.9%. I hope that we'll be able to preserve the funds made available for district and chancery court electronic filing, which I have already described, and for replacement of the Supreme Court's electronic filing system. Eliminating funding for e-filing in the district and chancery courts would result in additional delay in getting to digital courts in Wyoming. And if the Supreme Court system fails without a replacement av available, we will be back to operating as we did over a decade ago with paper. I do not believe that would appear impressive to business organizations sizing up the state as a place to do business and taking a hard look at its courts, and it would definitely be a step back. I would like to touch on another issue that relates to the relationship between our two branches of government. I want to emphasize that we could improve our communications and our branch, which is poorly understood, could and sh should take time to explain its processes to you. There seem to be a great many inaccurate rumors about court operations in this day and age. If you need to know the facts about operations in your area, there is at least one courthouse in every county with a circuit and district court based there. Although neither uh, judges nor clerks of court can comment on pending or resolved cases, they can and will talk to you as representatives of the people about what's going on in general terms of court operations. For example, are the circuit courts hearing landlord-tenant cases? Are, the, are divorces being heard and divorces granted in the district court? The answer is emphatically not only yes, they are, because they are, but they have been. That never ended. If you don't uh, know whom to contact to learn more about operations in your area or whatever area you're, you're interested in, please feel free to email me or call my office and I will make sure someone uh, who knows the answer to your questions uh, gets back to you with a definitive response. And as I already mentioned, we have uh, an excellent judicial branch website that is intended to let the public know what is going on in our branch. It is free and open to the public and of course to you. Ours is a data-driven branch and we 
store a lot of information that is publicly available there. At a meeting of the National Conference of Chief Justices a while back, I learned from the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court that that court holds what it calls a law school for legislators to inform Illinois lawmakers about the Illinois judicial branch and its operations. Our own Justice Keith Kautz, who manages judicial education and who has spoken frequently to civic organizations, is prepared to provide a program of about an hour or so to legislators interested in it with assistance from our court staff and the circuit and district judges. We would plan to record and store this on our website for future viewing by legislators and the public. I hope we can work something out to make that available. I would add an, another comment sort of on this general topic. As I've already said more than once, our branch of government is going through what may be the most difficult time in its history. Our trial courts and trial judges are being tested by challenges from the pandemic and from the current economic downturn, and they have met those challenges. I would put our trial court's performance in the pandemic and before up against that of the courts of any state, despite our small budget and overworked staff. The point I'm angling toward is that this may not be the best time to legislatively tinker with something that is working, particularly without consulting with the people who do the work of the courts. They are like a military unit that is pinned down by powerful forces, yet is holding its ground against all odds with few resources. In other words, this is not a great time for untested experimentation. <clears throat> I remind you that everything our courts do is governed by the constitutional requirement to provide due process. At its simplest, due process just means giving notice of what is happening in a case and giving people affected in that case a fair opportunity to be heard before a decision is made. Although our courts strive to be as efficient as possible, our Constitution does not focus on efficiency. It focuses on assuring that the rule of law governs and that everyone receives a fair process that protects the rights of all concerned. Of course, not everyone is happy with court outcomes. You can pretty much figure that at least 50% of litigants, and I'm talking about those who lost, will not be happy. Sometimes both sides lose. So satisfaction and happiness are not the usual byproducts of the judicial process. Fortunately for our system, Respect is and has been a byproduct of the process. Most often, those who are disappointed by the outcome of a case can still recognize that they were heard and treated fairly. I have recently seen draft legislation that seems intended to address perceived problems in court operations that don't actually exist and which may run into constitutional obstacles according to legislative service office commentary. Some of the drafts seem to have been created in a vacuum of information about actual court processes and what is happening on the ground. I can tell you from a personal standpoint that after over 40 years as a trial lawyer, a trial judge, a Supreme Court justice, and now a chief justice, I do not know enough to suggest changes to the operation of the trial courts without talking to the judges and court personnel who actually do the work. I would therefore simply suggest that the district and circuit judges are happy to talk about their operations with legislators, as is our court. Even a process that has been operating successfully in the Anglo-American countries for centuries can always be improved. I'll grant you that. But I can't help but believe that knowing how it does operate and why it does so might be a good starting place and that the knowledge base of a disgruntled litigant or rumor may not be the best launching pad for meaningful change. If you inquire, and I hope you do, I think you'll find that our branch is in fact in very good shape compared to that of our sister states and that the employees and judges daily enforce the rule of law here in Wyoming while still moving cases through the system promptly so that justice is not denied. Before I close, I wanted to take the usual step of describing transitions in our branch. 
Retired District Judge Art Hanscom, who sat in Albany County for many years, died on February 20, 2020. Judge Bob Castor, longtime circuit judge sitting in Albany County, retired, and Judge Rob Sanford uh, replaced him on July 4, 2020. That's right, Judge St Sanford started to work on the 4th of July, which I think is a pretty active time in uh, Laramie and Albany County. Longtime Laramie County Circuit uh, Judge Denise Now retired, and she was replaced by Judge Sean Chambers on July 6, 2020. Judge Vincent Case, who sat in Converse County for many years, retired, and Judge Clark Allen took his place. Sixth Judicial District Judge Nick Deegan, longtime public servant and judge, and also a former member of the Wyoming House of Representatives, retired and was replaced by Judge Stuart Healy in December of 2020. We thank all of the judges who have served for their many years of faithful service, and we thank all of those who have undertaken to fill their very large shoes for their willingness to do so in this extremely challenging time. You all have your work cut out for you. We have our own transitions at the Wyoming Supreme Court. Court Administrator Lily Sharp, whom many of you know from her service at LSO, and who made us all smile with her ever ready and infectious laugh, retired in February. After an intense and exhaustive process that included a number of excellent in and out of state applicants, our general counsel, Elisa Butler, was selected to be our new court administrator. She has always been a joy to work with, and I know she will be reaching out to you if you don't reach out to her first to see how she can assist you in your work. <coughs> Excuse me. And I have what may be more good news to close with. This will be the last time I have the great privilege of making a state of the judiciary address to this body. If we were meeting in person, I'm sure that would have drawn some applause because I really have talked for quite a while today. I will reach the age of mandatory retirement before you convene in 2022. And so Justice Kate Fox will take over as Chief Justice on July 1 of this year to assure a smooth transition. Justice Fox will become just the second woman Chief Justice in Wyoming history. She has basically served as a Deputy Chief since I became Chief Justice, no doubt in an effort to try to keep me from making major mistakes, and she will be able to take over seamlessly as Chief Justice mid-year. Our state and our branch We'll be fortunate to have such a great Chief Justice. For my part, I want to thank you all for the consideration you have shown me, the Supreme Court, and the judicial branch. The founders of our republic and our great state intended for there to be tension between the branches of government so that we would all be keeping an eye on each other to preserve our democracy and to uphold the rule of law. This tension, which we have in a healthy measure in Wyoming, has not prevented an appropriately cordial and respectful relationship between us and the rest of the branch and I are grateful for that mutual respect. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you. You face unprecedented challenges this session and beyond, but we all know that you are more than equal to the enormous task before you. Thank you, each and every one, for your selfless service. Good luck to you all, and Godspeed. Thank you.